The Gulf oil spill is undeniably the worst environmental disaster in human history. In this video we will identify the key factors which led to this disaster, reveal some of the key history behind oil, and talk about the real problems we face as a civilization addicted to oil. This video will outline the basis for the suppression of alternative energy technologies as well as expose the inner workings of the corrupt infrastructure that we must overcome in order to kick our oil habits and restore peace and freedom. Oil has a long and checkered history of greed, corruption, and empire from the early days of John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil Company to being the decisive factor in the outcome of World War II to the invasion and occupation of Iraq as well as third world exploitation. It is now public knowledge that CIA Director George Tenet falsified the case for WMDs and that the real reason for the invasion of Iraq was for oil. This is duly confirmed by the invasion strategy and the construction of permanent U.S. military bases positioned directly on the oil fields. But it's not really that simple, you see. In late 2000, Saddam Hussein threatened to switch to the euro for trading oil and was pushing to convert Iraq's $10 billion reserve fund at the UN to euros. This information about Iraq's oil currency has been censored by the U.S. media for the interest of the White House, Federal Reserve, and most importantly, the international bankers. Here's why. A country cannot produce an economy without energy. If countries are forced to trade in their money for U.S. dollars in order to buy energy, the value of the U.S. dollar is increased proportional to the price of oil. So by then increasing the price of oil, you increase the amount each person has to now exchange for the same gallon of energy through the petrodollar, and the transaction balances out the deficit in the currency. This gives the currency its intrinsic value. Money's just paper otherwise. Meanwhile, the central and international bankers who without this artificial bubble are in all reality bankrupt can keep their currency from crashing. Now combine this with the fact that Iran and North Korea, the two other axes of evil, were also planning to switch off the US dollar to the euro. The picture starts to become clearer. The banking systems of the Western world and most of the globe rely on the commoditization of finite raw resources that are forcefully traded through the US dollar in order to keep their currency and economic frameworks afloat. Dishonest and corrupt banking practices around the world create an unnatural dependency on oil and other forms of energy. This is why economic hitmen like John Perkins say that their first job was to construct a power plant and loan third world countries the money at interest to pay for it, thereby enslaving them through debt and dependence on the energy and its infrastructure. In his book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, William Black details the process by which banks create money virtually out of nothing through a process known as fractional reserve banking. Earlier in Europe, banks would hold people's gold deposits and issue them paper banknotes to represent their gold being held in the vaults. The banks realized that people only touched a small fraction of the gold in the reserve and began lending out double the amount of banknotes than they had gold in the vault. The term fractional reserve comes from this process of only keeping a fraction of the deposits in reserve, thereby allowing the rest to be lent out at interest. And as long as too many people didn't try to exchange their paper money back for gold at the same time, the banks would still have enough gold in the vault to cover those who did. By doing this, they were able to create money that wasn't really backed by anything except for the paper that it was printed on, meanwhile allowing them to lend it out to others while collecting interest on this money that didn't really exist. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913 leading into World War I and was a way for competing bankers to create a cartel capable of lending massive amounts of money created out of nothing to the countries in the war, and then collect immense amounts of interest from these nations indebted to this privately owned corporation after the war. The Federal Reserve is able to print money at a 9 to 1 ratio, not just 2 to 1, which means that they can lend out 90% of their net worth while claiming it is still fully intact. This money is then lent to other banks, where 90% of that money can then be lent out again, over and over, through this fractional reserve process, until $100 can be turned into $10,000 out of thin air. The result of this is the dilution of the U.S. dollar's value. When the Fed prints more banknotes than it has value in reserves, it reduces the buying power of the bills already in circulation. A common trick used to balance out the devaluation caused by fractional reserve banking is the use of inflation. The bankers say, oh, it's not that the buying power of the U.S. dollar has gone down, it's just that it takes more of the same money to buy the same things as before, which is a deceptive way of basically saying the same thing. The trick is to view money as a tradable commodity, so when countries buy energy or oil through a particular currency, the price assigned to the oil is transferred to the value of the money used to pay for it. This sleight-of-hand transaction adds value to the U.S. dollar, which balances out the dilution and lost buying power caused by this fractional reserve practice. 
In the six years leading up to the Great Depression in 1929, the Federal Reserve expanded its money supply 60% beyond its actual reserve, which in part led to the crash of the stock exchange. After the value of industries, companies, and properties hit rock bottom, the bankers were able to buy out much of the United States' colleges, newspapers, and industries at cut-rate prices. And don't forget that they were able to print more money out of nothing to pay for these purchases while everyone else was down and out. Similar corrupt practices have been used in the past, even leading up to the creation of antitrust laws. Oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil spent several years shipping his oil at half price while undercutting his own cost. As a result, he was able to put all of his competitors out of business. After ruthlessly annihilating all the competition, he then jacked up the price of oil to four times what it was before he got into the business. This led to the corporate enslavement of U.S. citizens, who then revolted, forcing the Congress to enact the Standard Oil Antitrust Laws. Two years later, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and other international banking interests created a privately owned Federal Reserve under the guise of being a federal bank, with one of the most destructive fractional reserve policies to date. The U.S. has been completely dependent on trading oil in U.S. dollars in order to keep their fractional reserve currency afloat since at least the 1980s, and having a country like Iraq, Iran, or North Korea, never mind all three, switch off the U.S. dollar for oil would be catastrophic for the fractional reserve bubble. So back in late 2000, when the axis of evil began making moves to switch off of the U.S. dollar, the White House, Wall Street, and Federal Reserve were facing a complete and total collapse of their system. They had no other choice but to make a case for war. And so we have the Bush administration and CIA fudging the case for WMDs in Iraq, while designing a military strategy based around destroying Iraq's alternative energy infrastructure and setting up permanent U.S. military bases around oil reserves. More importantly than simply gaining control of the oil, however, was the act of preventing them from switching their oil currency to the euro, as well as keeping them locked into the system of oil by taking out their alternative energy. In the same vein, when the U.S. threatened Iran, they focused on destroying their nuclear silos with airstrikes to take out their alternative energy rather than attacking or invading the actual country. Again, pushing countries who route oil exchange through the U.S. dollar to keep their production and export focused on oil and not alternative energies. There's also the issue of Afghanistan, which has had a 1,000% increase in opium production since the U.S. invasion, since the bankers also rely on the billion-dollar-a-year drug industry. Drug money gets laundered through the banks, who use it to balance out the money supply further. It's also important to point out that the bankers who are benefiting and protecting this corrupt infrastructure were initially international bankers, prior to creating the Federal Reserve which was done partly to become the creditors of the globalizing empire that is the United States of America. If you look at who is making the most off of the wars, most would think that it's Halliburton. Dick Cheney had close to 450,000 stocks in Halliburton during the Iraq War, and the Carlyle Group who are making a massive amount of money through the contracts to build military bases, planes, tanks, ammo, vests, etc. Halliburton also does a lot of the corporate development in the countries around the world after wars and disasters such as Indonesia and Katrina, as well as building a prison industry in the land of the free. The trillions of dollars funding the production of these products that are lining Cheney and Bush's pockets generally comes from the U.S. tax dollars, as well as the bonds created out of nothing from the Federal Reserve that lowers the buying power of the U.S. dollar. However, the biggest profiteers are the creditors of the U.S. debt, who are the international bankers. They get the whole spending net worth of a country back at 100% plus interest. The sum of this net worth consists of all the Carlisle, Halliburton, federal and state spending of the country, and more. The banking empire remains in the background, while cronies like Bush and Cheney are able to make large sums of money while appearing to be the top of the corruption. There is nothing more important to geopolitical expansion as effective expendability. Potential fall guys who take the limelight. They are the ones who take the public risk to make money off of geopolitical and military policy, but are expendable and replaceable under the greater international owning class. This international owning class can invest anywhere in the world and seems to drift further and further away from national identity or accountability. During the Bush administration, Dick Cheney deregulated oil drilling policy, which resulted in BP not being required to follow safety standards. But only while inside the U.S. The entire BP oil spill disaster, which is set to kill all the sea life in the North Atlantic in the next 50 years, could have been prevented by the purchase of a simple safety device known as an acoustic switch. On the heels of record profits for BP, the cost of the switch amounted to one-seventh of one percent. Compare that with the cost of the cleanup of this disaster. In order to survive as a species, prevent wars for oil, and corrupt economic systems dependent on the continuation of these practices, 
Humanity can no longer tolerate the multilateral damage caused by the oil industry's stranglehold on raw energy. The time is now, and most of the technology is already here. It is up to us, as a human race, to work towards the development of alternative energies, clean energies, renewable energies.